thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Thursday evening. We really appreciate it. Um, Joe Sperry, our superintendent of public works, and myself, I'm Karen Price, I'm on the village board, want to welcome you to this. And I also want to recognize we have um, three other board members here tonight, Trustee Gary LaRue, Trustee Alan Mosco, and Trustee Jerry Gillis. So we're here, we're here for you. If you have questions at any time about anything, reach out to us. That's what we're here for. But we want to thank you for coming out. And I really want to thank <coughs> Helen and Flood Lopi and Five and Six and Seven and Eight and Nine and Ten because you've grown exponentially. Um, because I don't think we would be here tonight if it weren't for Helen and Flood Lothian, and Middle Lothian in their efforts. So first of all, I want to give them a huge round of applause. No, just move the camera, move the camera on the paper. <laughs> no, 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 Gary, watch. It doesn't work. There. There you go. Do we need another ream of paper? You can see we have a huge technology budget here. It works. Move it a little closer. Yeah, move it closer. Yeah, it's still okay. I'll, I'll tell you what's funny. It's too small. We tried it before, it's too small. Okay, so um, in addition to ourselves, um, I think there might be some people in the room who um, are from other organizations here, really, because they can help us develop this very many plan. So who, those of you who were residents of Midlothian or and neighboring communities, can you put up your hands? So that's the majority. Those of you who aren't, can you stand up? And can you just introduce yourselves? Uh, yeah, I'm George Belvix with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Hi, I'm Julia Plum. I'm heading up a new social enterprise organization called High Bridge, and we'll be insta installing rain gardens, biosoils throughout the area. Actually, just a little bit uh, further south. My name is Elsie Pavlock. I'm with Metropolitan Planning Council, and I was a former graduate student at UIC who helped with one of the uh, economic development. You did. Plans. I remember you, Kelsey. You did. <laughs> what, which team were you on? Which plan? The um, one going down 147. The, the transit orient development? Yes. Okay. Closer to the, yeah, the transit. Mm -hmm. Her work's in one of these plans. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we've actually got two presentations. Oh, sorry. Yes. I'm Melissa Dunes from the Active Transportation Alliance. Welcome. So, so thank you very much, all of you, for, for coming and joining. Um, there's two presentations going on. There's been two parallel bits of pieces of work. Um, work that uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and CMT have been doing um, called Rain Ready, and I'll tell you a bit about that. 
and work that MWRD have been doing. And what we've been doing, particularly in relation to solutions to flooding around Natalie Creek. And we're here together because we've been coordinating more and more to make sure that we come up with some kind of integrated solution. So I'll tell you a bit more about the Rain Ready uh, work. Um, Rain Ready is a program to help neighborhoods fight flooding and keep homes and businesses dry. That should resonate with most of you. Um, and we've got various partners who we've been working with. And we're, we're currently piloting the program in two communities, Midlothian and uh, Chatham, which is a community in the south side of Chicago. So in the room, as I said, are, are residents and businesses, um, as well as some other key stakeholders. I didn't realize this was section by section. So there's really three things that we want to discuss with you. We're going to, we're going to uh, feed back to you. You will spend a lot of time filling in property surveys and filling in maps, from largely through Fladlothian and Midlothian. Um, uh, and we're going to feed back some of the information, some of the things you told us as a result of that. And then um, MWRD has kind of built on that and sort of done some mapping and analysis which they're going to talk you through. Uh, then MWRD is going to present their analysis in relation to Natalie Creek. And then I'm just going to very quickly talk you through sort of the first stage of our thinking about solutions. So this is really an interim feedback. This is more about us reporting back to you what we heard you tell us plus the analysis, and then later on we'll come back and say, and, we'll, and, and, and you know, get your feedback in terms of the suite of solutions. Um, there's not much time for feedback in this actual meeting. Uh, if you missed out on doing a property survey and would still like your voice you know, expressed in a property survey, you can fill one out here. Um, we're going to show you some of the mapping, but if you, if you don't feel as though your specific issues have been reflected, there's a map, scribble on and, and make that yours. Um, there's a steering committee that will be set up, uh, so that's a, the perfect way for feedback. And we've also put up flip charts, which is a good time if you want to give feedback right now. Uh, you can scribble on post-it notes, which Burrell has, and then stick them on there. So after the meeting, um, we'll get to come up with an interim report, which is a more comprehensive report um, from, this, from this evening, and then work with you to develop options with the idea of having some final plan in September 2015. And I suppose we're kind of hoping that maybe we can identify some quick actions as well this year or you know, the early, early 2016, so that we can actually feel that we've got a sense of momentum, things are moving, you're finding solutions. So what did you tell us? Um, we did a mailing, a survey to all residents in Midlothian. That was 4,335 postcards. I led to people to the survey plus paper copies. We had a 6% response rate, 258 survey responses. Um, of those people who responded, the majority own the property, um, most single family units, most have some kind of basement, um, most don't live in the floodplain, and your long-term, your long-term owners, 28.5 years in in the village, um, and you're you're largely expressing. So some of you say you don't flood. Of those that do, it's a whole mixture of problems that are going on. Uh, of the people who did flood, 95% uh, described the problem as systemic and chronic. So what we did was we went, we went, we looked. We analysed both the quantitative, the data that you gave us, and then we went through your comments and we scored them, we, we um, coded them, so that we could come up with some common themes. And so not only did you find flooding chronic and systemic, but it was interesting that you, it, you, many of you experienced it both as a shared problem, i.e. you had flooding on your property and you saw water out on the street, therefore you knew your neighbours were suffering that problem, but many of you suffered it as a private problem, i.e. you had flooding in your property, but there was no flooding on the street. So you've got this mixture of things going on. Um, so here's some of the things that we ended up coding, because they were repeat themes that were coming up again and again. And the third, you know, these will resonate to you, but I just, I'm feeding them back to you. This notion of, of water coming from creeks to your basements. The, and I've just picked a quote for each one, but these will reflect many, many quotes. So when the ponds are full from current rain and we get another storm, the water has no place to go but reach the banks and backflow the stormwater sewers into the subdivision, 
causing flooding and power outages. Once the power goes out, basements start flooding in the subdivision. But the other thing that was going on is this flooding from neighbor to neighbor, and this, this sense of constantly having to shift water around. So the one neighbor next to me built a huge garage with no gutters that all drains to me, as does the cement drive he put in, which is much higher than my property, about six inches. Again, the, the really um, interesting thing is this reliance on pumps. So many of you mentioned pumps. It's the way you're managing this excess water. And it's a feeling that it's being circulated around and around in the village. And, and that, it's, it, you know, that you're using it as an indicator. So we have to stay alert when the water starts coming in. If our <coughs> pump can't keep up or goes out, the water will raise too high and drown our furnace, water heater, washer and dryer. Therefore, whenever it rains, someone needs to be here to monitor the pump. Our ears stay tuned to the running pump as we sleep. You found it costly and exhausting. We recently excavated the inside and side perimeter of our home to put a sophisticated drainage system across 32,000. We now have four sump pumps that run constantly, even when there's little rain. You expressed a fear of leaving the property. We're not able to leave our home when there's storms or delays of repeat rain. You expressed anxiety. While others can go out to bed and fall asleep during a rain shower, we're making decisions. If we need to put things up, who will stay up for the first watch? All, our, all the while, our stomachs are churning. Or the water problem is the worst. Our neighbors are going to put their house for sale in the spring, but we can't afford to move. But pretty soon, we won't be able to afford to stay here either. The impact on property values. Solving this issue will help return some of our lost home values and improve the atmosphere of the economic development within the village. The sense of abandonment. Now all we have is flooding and empty stores and homes. Something needs to occur to fix these situations. And the sense of disorder. The sidewalks are up in terrible shape to the point that kids can barely even ride bikes on them without hitting large potholes or large puddles of rainwater pumping out of sump pumps. There's those sump pumps again. So in summary, some of the things that you told us was that you found that chronic flooding is both a shared and private experience. You perceive flooding to be systemic and chronic in the village. Households compete with neighbors and with the village to remove excess water. There's this thing that you know, the village is pumping the water here and we're pumping it out, or your neighbors are pumping it here and we're pumping it out. That you report anxiety due to flooding. The flooding is perceived to impact property values and create a sense of abandonment. And you, and you relate flooding to neighborhood disorder. So that's, that's mine. And now Erin um, is going to tell you some of the mapping that she's done that includes some of the results as well. Thank you. So we're going to take a second to try to um, adjust the, the screen here or bring the... the uh, monograph. Well, we're, we've got a lot of maps that we're going to show, and so some of them have a lot of colors on this. We, I, I fear it might be a little bit difficult to see. So we're going to, uh, we have, I think we're a little bit ahead of schedule right now, so we'll just set it up and ask you uh, what you prefer, if that's okay. And do, so do you, do you want to take questions now? Do any of you, obviously that was a, just a massive summary of what you told us, and we're going to be doing a full report that will give much more information. But meanwhile, do you have any questions on that? Um, I was I'm a little disappointed to see that only 600 people responded to the survey. Yeah. 6%. Oh, I mean, sorry, 6%. Six percent. Yeah. Could we, if, if we really put a grassroots effort out to get the surveys out and get more people to fill out the surveys, can you still accept the information? Absolutely. And I, I, I think it's a reflection. So if I was to do it again, I would do it with longer time period. I would do two mailings. I would you know, spend a lot more time focused on getting you to fill in those surveys. So it's a lesson for us. Thank you. And if you want to take surveys and hand them to your neighbors, they do. Yeah. We, we find that to be a very effective way. It's, it's a lot easier for someone to fill out uh, something like this when it comes from uh, a fellow resident uh, than from an outside organization. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think the wall. David, I think. I think the wall. Yeah. Your disorder slide. <laughs> Somewhere in that presentation, it was titled Disorder. Today, no less, I had this camera that you're already familiar with that I take places. I was at Cement Creek at 149th and Kilpatrick. I actually even had Natalie Creek in my backyard when I lived in Oak Forest. Somebody showed up, by the way, and hung out while I'm sitting here. Yes, as you know that some of our intent has been we wanted to catch video. So we did do that today, by the way. But it's, there was a change done in Oak Forest, right by where I used to live, where St. Damien's is, where, you know, a pretty decent chunk of change. I spent, I haven't done research, I just noticed it because I've walked past it. Does that make sense? And I hope that these multi-jurisdictional issues that continue to be created, you know, that had to change something. What would it take to get another meter there to be able to then have results from two specific points? One that flows in Midlothian, <laughs> you know, and breaks the banks a, a lot faster than right, you know, has been what people have said, kind of thing. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much those things cost. Is that better? Is that better? Open them to good use. Yeah. Is it more clear for you this way with the light off? Yeah. Very good. So we, we did allow more time for questions afterwards, so so we can go into questions. And this sort of regional issue comes up a bit in here. Okay. But we're getting we're getting or. Yeah, or. <laughs> How many engineers does it take to fix it? Uh oh. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Not in their job. Okay. Well, now I didn't put it down. I didn't put it down. Feel free to write down your comments on the post-it notes and uh, stick it up on the board as you go on your way out. Okay, thanks for bearing with us. We, Like I said, we've got a lot of math, so we wanted to show you just wanted to make sure that um, we had the best setup so that you all can see that. Yay. Is there a place online that we can see this also? Engineers. Um, with an engineer at work. Not right yeah, but what would you submit for? Okay. So, hi, I'm Erin Maloney. I'm a hydraulic engineer at the Army Corps of Engineers, and um, I've been working with a couple of my colleagues who are here today. Let me just let them introduce themselves before I get into the presentation. Um, I am Matt Samara with the US Army Corps. I'm the project manager on, on this. I am David Vaccaro. I'm a hydraulic engineer also and a planner. And uh, it's good to see all you folks again. I was here in the fall for the, the public meeting before. I'm Rick Atkinson. I'm a hydraulic engineer. I've been working with here. So um, we've, we've learned a lot about midloading in the last few months, um, or you know, over a year here. And I've got a lot of information that I wanted to show you. And so I kind of wanted to start by putting it into some context as to um, kind of a summary of what we learned. And I thought it would be the best to kind of Put that up front so as I go through the presentation, you can kind of fit, fit what I'm talking about into these um, kind of key points of things that we've taken away from, from the research that we've done. So um, first of all, as Harriet's already talked a lot about, is we know that there's a lot of flooding in Midlothian and that it's very widespread um, all across the village. It's not, um, it's not easy to pinpoint specific areas because the survey results show that, that there's flooding everywhere. Um, Flooding has various sources. We've got flooding from <coughs> creeks overflowing from their banks. We've got flooding from storm sewers backing up or not having enough capacity. And we have flooding from sanitary sewers backing up into the basements of homes. So we've got a lot of different mechanisms of flooding that we're dealing with here. We know that property owners oftentimes um, will flood and they may be right next, next door to a property that doesn't flood. We know that even for those property owners that that don't flood, that they're still concerned about flooding because they see how it's impacting their neighbors in, the, in their area. Um, we know that Midlothian, the village of Midlothian, is impacted by other communities within its watershed, and that Midlothian also impacts other communities within the watershed. We know that the flooding is, is historical, 
and that it's a, it's a symptom of a lot of different things, but part one of those things is the topography of the area. And we also know that there have been ordinances that have been in place since the 70s that have uh, attempted to, to offer some sort of protection against the flooding. So in that context, the, uh, my presentation will cover, um, will follow this structure here. First I'll talk about what we know about all the information that we've collected about the um, flooding problems that, we were, that we're aware of. Then we'll talk about the watersheds that are within the Midlothian. And then we'll talk a little bit about the history of, of the area. We'll talk about the topography and um, some of the research that we've done to kind of dig into the history of what's, what's happened here. And uh, finally, we'll talk about some of the additional data analysis that we've done, data gathering, that kind of helps show a full picture. So moving into the summary of the flooding problems. Up here is a map that's kind of a composite map, and it's a, it's a little diff difficult to see with the stripe, but um, we'll get through it. So this, this composite map is, um, has kind of two sources of information. The first source is information that we collected from village officials of areas that, that are thought of to, as to be um, flooding problem areas. So we know that there's some ditch overtopping issues here on 145th, and that we've got some, the orange area here and here represent sanitary sewer um, backup areas, and those are kind of <coughs> general areas that we know that that's an issue. Um, we've got storm sewer backup, and we've kind of identified some hot spots in the yellow, all the yellow spots around on the map. Um, and those are just some of the hot spots that we're aware of. And this blue square here represents an area that we know that has a high water table, so that the groundwater is up um, not too far underneath the level of the, level of the soil. Um, so that's the information that we collected from the village. And then additionally, we have some information that we received from the Flavodian team. Um, and those are kind of in the, in the blue and the pink uh, areas here. Um, kind of delineating a little bit more specifically where um, where they, what where the Flodovia team is aware of flooding problems, and a lot of those areas are overlapping what the village had reported. Um, and so, as Harry said earlier, we, we have a lot of we know a lot of flooding issues, but we may have missed some of the some of those things. So this map up on the wall here um, is the same map or very similar to what's up on the screen right now. So if um, if you feel like your area is represented here, we're still kind of collecting information, so feel free, please let us know if we're missing anything. So we've also collected a lot of survey information, and this is kind of a summary of the information um, in, in a map form that Harriet had discussed earlier. So the, the first, you know, the main question is asking people, do you flood or do you not flood? And we, we see that almost 60% of the respondents in the survey do flood, and those are represented by the red dots on the map. And as you can see, the red dots are pretty widespread all across the village, and um, the red dots are kind of interspersed with the blue dots, and um, oftentimes in clumps all in the same area. So then when we, we switch the question to say, are you concerned about flooding or water problems on your property, the percentage goes up. So 80, over 80% 80 of the respondents of the survey reported that they are concerned about water. So even though only about 60% reported that they actually flood, we know a lot more folks are concerned. So those, these red dots here show where concern is. The blue is not concerned and the, um, the greenish is, I don't know. And so we kind of wanted just to get a sense of what, um, what kind of flooding people are experiencing. So when we look at the folks that responded that they do flood, when we divide that into different types of flooding, the blue dots here represent flooding inside the home or inside the structure. Yellow is reporting flooding on the streets, and green is in yards. So obviously we're, we're most concerned with flooding of structures themselves, but um, we want to be aware of where all, source, all types of flooding are occurring. So that's kind of the information. We know there's a lot of flooding, and so that's kind of the summary of the problems. And so now I want to talk a little bit about the watersheds that um, impact Midlothian and that Midlothian impact. So this map here um, shows the watersheds that are included within the village. So there's four separate watersheds, and this, this, um, these watersheds have been provided to us by the NWRD. So um, they delineated out the watersheds, and you can see there's four 
um, four different watersheds, and the blue arrows represent the direction of the, that the water flows. And so in the northwest por portion of town, um, the water flows north to the um, CalSag Troop C, which then eventually discharges into the CalSag Channel. Um, this kind of yellowish watershed here, that's Natalie Creek. And it flows um, kind of end right downtown in Midlothian. Um, Midlothian Creek watershed is this larger one here. And then on the um, eastern portion of town, the water drains kind of to the southeast to the um, Calumet Unage drainage, which then eventually flows into the Little Calumet River. So we've got kind of different flow paths within the village. So it's important to understand where the water is coming from and where the water is going to. So to kind of get an understanding of, of um, who, who is within the watersheds, we wanted to look at what other communities share the same watersheds with, with, with the Bolivian. So um, they, these dark blue lines represent the same lines as the watersheds here. So, um, and then we color the, the different communities so that you can see who, who you're sharing your watershed with. So um, we'll start with, with uh, the Midlothian watershed. You can see that Midlothian watershed starts upstream with, um, through Orland Hills and Orland Park and Tinley Park. It flows through Oak Forest. There's a little bit of Country Club Hills, and that's all before it gets to Midlothian. And then downstream of Midlothian, the watershed continues flowing through Robbins, Blue Island, and Posen. So there's a lot of communities that are, that are involved in just this one watershed, so it's important to understand that um, you know, there's a lot of different um, pieces to, to think of when we're thinking about how watersheds work. So um, highlighting, just quickly highlighting, this, is, this one here is Natalie Creek, um, which is a smaller watershed land-wise and um, is pretty much just impacted by Oak Forest and Midlothian. So now that we kind of have an understanding of the problems and of the watersheds themselves, we wanted to take a look at um, some of the history of the area because there's been a lot of questions about, you know, why is this flooding happening and is it, is it, is it something that's recently changed or is it something that's, you know, been ongoing over the years. So we, we did a lot of kind of historical research and wanted to share some of that with you. So um, kind of on the, on the glacial level, the, the history of how the, um, the land elevations Within, the, within Midlothian have been formed. It's, it's really interesting to look at. This map here um, portrays the relative elevation <coughs> of the area, and we've shaded it so that the, the green area here is the high area, and the, the pinker, darker colors on the, on the um, east side of the map is the lower area. Mm -hmm. And we've tried to um, use kind of some shadow shading to give you a, a good idea of um, what's high and what's low. And what we noticed, the first thing we noticed when we looked at this map was this kind of very definitive line here that looks, that appears to be kind of a sharp um, difference between the high parts of town and the low parts of town. And what we, what we discovered is that that boundary right there is the boundary line of the ancient um, Lake Chicago, which um, it's hard to imagine, but where we're standing here, we would have been, you know, underwater about 14,000, 10,000 years ago. So that Lake Chicago has, you know, it was a glacial lake since receded and it has formed what is now Lake Michigan and the other Great Lakes. Um, but at one time it was here in Midlothian and, you know, most of the region. And so that line here is where the furthest extents as, as where that lake was at one point. And so what's interesting to note is that um, we know there's a lot of flooding issues specifically here at Natalie Creek, um, and I think this is 149th and Kilpatrick. Um, and so what we noticed is that, hey, that, that spot right there is right downstream of where the water's flowing from kind of a hillier area with a little bit more topography, and then it kind of flows down a, a, a steep portion here, and then it, it flattens out quite a bit. And so it's interesting to note that you know, this is all a nature of, of how the, the land is laid out. <coughs> So we took a look a little bit at uh, coming back from you know 10,000 years ago to 75 years ago. We wanted to look at at the map of the, you know the most recent the the oldest era of photographs that we had because we've had some questions about whether or not the um, the waterways specific locations have been changing over the years. 
So I wanted to zoom in specifically to that same area that I was just talking about. And I hope you can see um, this area here, this is 149th Street, mm -hmm. and you can see that Natalie Creek flowing north. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, in 1939, it was already channelized um, and kind of straightened here onto 146th Street, just as it is today. So we know that the history of that specific waterway goes back to at least that time. Um, we were also wondering, because we know there have been a lot of issues with, with um, the, the water overflowing in its, or the banks of the creek here, kind of mm -hmm. spilling through the neighborhood. We wanted to see if in the historic photos if we could see any evidence of a, of a creek, of a channel there. And we don't see any evidence of that. Now that doesn't mean that there wasn't, you know, it wasn't wet there sometimes. But what it means is that there wasn't necessarily a defined channel at that time. So water may have flown over that area kind of in a... Um, shallow kind of sheet flow type of situation, but there was no, at least in this photograph, we don't see evidence of um, any kind of diversion channel that has since been um, removed. So this is just another um, piece of historical information that we took a look at. And so this is a map that's produced by the United States Geological Survey, and they put together maps that kind of um, show the topography of areas and where the waterways are, and they, they've been doing that for you know a long time. The oldest one that we were able to find was from 1901, so it's a pretty good source of data. Um, and so this is Midlothian here, and we can see at that time these blue lines here are representing where the creeks are, and they're roughly in 1901 in the same location as they were there today. But the, the interesting thing that, that we noticed was right here, this area right here is kind of the the area that on our problem area map was identified as a high water table area. And you can see this um, symbology on the map here kind of looks like marsh grass. And what that indicates is that at that time, that area was wet. Um, so we know Shed's that it's yeah. it was Shed's Pond. Shed's Pond. Hey, the quarry. Okay. Yeah. Somewhere. So, <laughs> so, the, so what we're seeing today has, you know, it's, it's not necessarily anything that's new. It's historic. And so we just wanted to, um, you know, do some his do some research about the history. So then, bringing it back to some more recent history, we were also wondering about um, how development within the watersheds have impacted flooding because we've heard some. There's a sense that flooding has been getting worse over the, over the more recent timeline, um, and so we just wanted to take a look at whether or not that could have been caused by development upstream within the watershed. So I have some maps to show you, but I first wanted to just say um, that we're going to compare some aerial topography or aerial maps to show development in the 70s versus today. But what we know is that um, in, since the mid-70s or the early 70s, the MWRD has had ordinances in place that do um, regulate the, the, the stormwater runoff on developments, um, and that was in place in from 1972 on in, in this area. So all the development that we've seen since that time should have complied with that ordinance. Uh, we just wanted to note too that um, just in 2014 that that ordinance was updated and has more stringent um, requirements. So basically, any kind of development now has uh, more stringent requirements for allowing how much water they're allowed to release from a site after it's developed and how much it must be stored onto the site. Um, but most of what we're looking at would have fell within the 1972 ordinance. <coughs> so this map here, what we did is we compared aerial photographs um, that we had from 1978 to aerial photographs that we had in 2009. And we identified areas that had been previously undeveloped in 1978 and um, are now developed. And so I've and digitize those areas with these, these colored squares here, or you know, shapes, and color them to indicate what type of development it is. Um, and you can see there, the, na this, the watershed boundary here, this is Natalie Creek. Um, there, wasn't, there hasn't been a whole lot of development within the watershed since 1978. Um, this, this green area down here is really the only um, change in terms of going from undeveloped to developed since that time, and that's the um, Forest Preserve Golf Course. <coughs> Now, Did you notice if Cement Creek was either on or not on one of those maps that is in front of us? I'm sorry, Cement Creek? 
the 149th and like Kilpatrick. It's one of those chokehold points right. where it's just this strip of cement. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and it was just a nickname <laughs> kind of thing. But I was out there today and there was discussion, you know, in the past about when that installment and that creation. <laughs> well, we know from the, um, that, that the creek was in the same alignment that it was. I, I don't know exactly if the structure, if that area has changed and, you know, when the concrete was laid, but we could look into that. So, and the okay. photographs we have are, you know, when you zoom in too close, you can't exactly see specifics so probably to that detail. This is more, and I'll show you a zoomed in photo uh, in a second so that you can get an idea of kind of the level of detail that we could see. But um, for, this is the Midlothian Creek watershed, and what you can see is most of the development um, since the since the late 70s has occurred kind of in the, the upstream portion of the watershed and it's been mostly residential areas um, and I've highlighted a few areas down here with the kind of darker outline um, and those are the only areas within the these two watersheds that we saw that have been developed since 2003 which was another um, era photograph that we had access to so I wanted to just zoom into this area so you can get a better picture of what that looked like then and what it looks like now um, so this is the 1978 aerial photograph, and so these, the outlines here are the same areas that you can kind of look at these, and then you can see how it changed. So I'll kind of toggle back and forth. So this is, that's the area now. So, yeah, so we've got quite a few residential developments. But remember, I, you know, kind of started off this this portion of the presentation by talking about the fact that when this development was installed there were ordinances in place that restricted the, the level of um, stormwater discharge to some to some level so um, while there has been a you know significant amount of development in this area those um, those residential areas should be complying with with that ordinance so we kind of started by talking about uh, the problems and, and the water understanding the watershed and talking about the history. And so I just wanted to talk about a few more pieces of, of data that we've analyzed to try to get a full picture of um, of you know the different sources and causes of, of flooding in the area. So this is just a map of the FEMA floodplains. And so FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, puts together maps which de which document the location of floodplains. And we know that the floodplain does not always equal where flooding is. Mm -hmm. So it's good to know where, where FEMA has defined floodplains, but we're, we're, we're aware that um, they're not always um, exactly where the flooding occurs. So for those of you who haven't seen this before, um, there's a couple different symbologies shown on the map. So the, the lighter blue areas over here, that's where the 1% um, annual chance floodplain is. And the darker blue represents the 0.2% annual chance, so that's kind of a um, less frequent um, flooding area. Now the hatch marks, that's called the floodway, and so the floodway is basically the area that conveys most of the flow through the waterway. So during a, during a flood event, the floodway is where you would see most of the water moving quickly, and in the, the floodplain areas, you would see water kind of, you know, maybe moving a little, but it's also going to be kind of pooling and ponding there. So the water will rise, but it won't be moving very quickly in that area. We've also taken a look at the storm sewer network in the area. Now, the village has, has a really good um, resource in the, the storm sewer atlas. And so there's a lot of information, and it's, it's too much to talk about the details, you know, at this scale. But we just wanted to point out that we've been taking a look at this information that we've We've identified some areas that we think potentially could be something that we could look at, but we're not at a point yet at this point where we can um, pinpoint specific problem areas related to the storm sewer network. Um, but just to, to give you an idea of, of how the system works, the different um, symbologies on the map kind of represent different things. So this area up here and down here, the kind of dark gray lines, that's the area where um, the where there's ditches that convey the water away from areas and into creeks, whereas all the different colored lines are storm sewers that are convey water underground through pipes and then discharge into the creeks. And then, I'm sure it's hard to see, but the little yellow dots um, are basically locations where the storm sewers or the ditches discharge into a creek. 
Um, and then the other interesting thing is that the Natalie Creek Waterway, I'm sure most of you know, is actually diverted through a diversion channel that flows north. So that's all through a, an underground conduit. We've also taken a look at the sanitary sewer network. We know that some people have some issues related to sanitary water flowing into their basements when the system um, doesn't have enough capacity. And so we wanted to understand how water flows within the sanitary sewer network. And so we've taken a look at that too. And again, we're not at a point right now where we have any specific areas to point out or problem areas, but we are taking a look and trying to understand how that system works. But what we think is actually um, something that we want to take more of a look at is that one of the issues with, san with the sanitary sewer is that oftentimes when lines become, you know, when they're older and aged, water can seep in through the ground into the sanitary sewer line, and that's, that's what causes the sewer to become, um, to become over or full and have too much, you know, it has too much water and it can't convey the water to where it needs to go. So during a rain event, when, there's a lot, when the ground is saturated, that water will find its way into the sanitary sewer lines. And that's what causes a lot of those surcharges into the basements. And so the village has been doing some work and is continuing to do work to inspect their sewer lines and maintain them and um, make sure that they're trying to minimize that, that infiltration into the system as much as possible. Um, but we know that sometimes, you know, a lot of the infiltration in the system can occur not only on the public property of this, the sanitary lines, but also on the lines that that reach from the from a home or a building to the sewer system, and that's that's a private property, private lateral line, and so we can't inspect all those, and we don't have data about that. But we we wanted to just get an idea. Of, we kind of made an assumption that if we look at the approximate age of a structure on a parcel, we can assume that the sanitary sewer line um, for for that building is approximately the same age as the building. You know, that may or may not be true if it's been replaced, but. We think it's a pretty good approximation. And so we wanted to map um, approximate ages of parcels. And this was based on parcel information that we have. And so they, the, the ages may or may not be exactly right, but we grouped them together. And so you can see that the purple bluish areas, those parcels are about 50 to 75 years. The orange parcels are 75 to 100 years, and the red parcels, which there's not too many of, um, are 100 years or greater. And so those areas where we see kind of some of the older 50 to 75 and 75 to 100 are areas that we think maybe could, could um, use a little bit more inspection to see if those, if those lateral lines are causing an infiltration issue that um, we maybe could address. So that's all the data collection we've done, and I know it's a lot, so I wanted to kind of wrap up again with um, just kind of summarizing again what we learned, and hopefully the maps that you saw will help um, to kind of think about those maps as I talk through again what we've learned. So obviously we know flooding is widespread, and that it has a lot of different sources. So I showed you the um, some of the reasons why we know that there's overbank flooding. We know the watersheds that impact the creeks, and we know the topography impacts the creeks. We've also um, I showed you the sanitary sewer maps, which we're still kind of digging into and researching, as well as the um, storm sewer maps. Again, we know that properties are often located adjacent to other properties that may or may not flood, and that um, that pretty much everyone, you know, a lot of people in the community, whether or not they flood, they're aware of flooding and, and concerned about it. We took a look at the watershed maps so we have a better understanding of which communities are impacting and impacted by, um, by Midlothian, and that we know that a lot of the issues within the community are historical and that they've been things that have been in place for, for a long time. And um, we also know that a lot of the development, within, there has been a significant amount of development within the watershed, but that uh, most of that development that we looked at, at least since the 70s, has been fallen within some type of ordinance that would have offered some level of protection. <coughs> So that's my information, um, my email address if you wanted to contact me that way. And that's about all I have, so if you, I think we can open it up for questions. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are none, right? You know, I'm just asking yeah. a question. It looked like in Natalie Creek as it came into Midlothian, it branched into two separate forms. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I, I should have explained that.
thanks for bringing it up. And, and what I, I um, maybe would have been a better way to, to, sim to symbolize that on the map is kind of showing a hatch mark. That, that line is the line that um, FEMA uses to, to show where the creek is. However, we know that normally that, there is not a creek there, right? But there's, there's a lot of water that when, when it overflows its bank during the 100 year or 1% annual chance flood, that is kind of a flow path as defined by FEMA. So that's the line that we use. But normally the flow path is just that northern path where you know that the channel is. So, thanks well for then, what's that, that? What's that branch that goes off to the left? Oh. That's a flow path. That's not the creek. Let me. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're running, we're running over on time, so let, let's uh, oh, okay. the, go, go ahead with this, and then we'll we'll all stay here again. Sorry, we have, uh, we've got plenty of time. Yeah, we, have Pardon? we have plenty of time. Oh, we I thought up. she was supposed to finish at seven forty. Nah, uh, yeah. no. no. And now eight twenty. Oh, oh, oh I'm well, sorry. Yeah, you have half an hour of questions. Yeah. <laughs> If you if you don't have okay. any burning questions, then I guess we could wait until. No, we're good. Can I bring something I back? You mentioned you would be interested in following through on that what I nicknamed yep. <laughs> Cement Creek. Yes. If, if just a little more uh, research into all these man-made points in this system of watershed or the channels or. Whatever. Yeah. And, I, and I should have mentioned too in that the presentation that, that Cedric is going to follow up with, that, that the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District has been doing a lot of work to actually study the flow within the channels and the waterways themselves. And so they're looking at options um, for different projects. So, I, so he'll talk a little bit more about that and then we can kind of learn from what he talks about and then maybe we can see where there's gaps between some of the areas that you're concerned about. Mm -hmm. Say something to that. I, I, I believe this is an educated guess that channel from Kilpatrick to Knox, you talk about the yeah. concrete. Mm -hmm. I, what I think that is, is that is keeping the water from that retention pond to get in there, and that was probably designed for all those apartment buildings they built. Mm -hmm. yeah. So instead of all that runoff going and directly hitting the creek, it stays in that retention pond until it builds up and it joins it back with the creek. It's but that's only guess. because a pipe leak puts itself out. Past where the meter went up. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's an outlet that if you picture where they installed right. the new meter, sorry, but there was a new meter. Okay. It was installed in such a way where here's the meter, but here's that culvert or whatever a pipe or just outlet for that watershed you're suggesting kind of thing. It wasn't a good spot to put it. Well, and there was, how about maybe there was just better ways of doing it, yeah. too. Oh, how about better. just a, that kind of sorry uh, thing? The, uh, uh, USGS uh, uh, is the one that installed it. And they came here, and they really worked hard uh, to install the location. They worked very hard for the location. And that really was, they determined that that's the best location that they can uh, they could install and can actually monitor the flow too at the same time. Okay, was anything looked into as to why the steel beams were put at such close intervals? Because that's a place that needs to be potentially dredged at certain, you know, points. Joe, you know, we've called and complained to him, you know, about cloggings. That happened and stuff. But those steel beams do influence our abilities to use machinery, you know, to do that kind of stuff. And I'm just thinking if you're familiar with it, you know. I know what you're talking about, but I, I mean, I don't know who designed it or whatever, but those are just structural that steel is to hold the channel. Right. Whenever it was put in, so but it has nothing to do with it the, has nothing the to do with the gauge. No, no. Yeah, the gauge was just installed. Can any be removed? I mean, is it that? Because I'm not. Is it really? Isn't, isn't this the point of it? Is to hold the cement? I would imagine right. the water would eventually the rip it apart. And the and the, and the screens on the channel. It's yeah, those part are of the whole part of the channel. Right. It holds the cement There's a few that look like they want to fall. Yeah. So the. You know, a lot this storm sewer networks and ditch networks and all those types of systems do require a lot of, you know, maintenance and cleaning out and, and that's something that I know that the village does do. So if there's, you know, specific 
and problem areas. And, and the flow there is really, really <coughs> complex. I mean, it, it is, is but know, it's it, uh, from what I heard and what we were, uh, you know, talking to um, other people. It's just the water. Once it gets to a certain height, it goes everywhere. Are we talking about right, right here? Uh, yes. 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 Like 149th and yeah. That goes 90 and yeah. it goes so 90 and yeah. it's right by and our well, house. There it is where it makes the 90 us, degree right. turns. Did we discover when, what time frame that occurred? You know, when did they make the water decide to take a few 90 yes. degree turns? If you guys let me go yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see you talk about that more specifically. We'll let Senator talk about that in his presentation. And then he'll have we'll time for questions after. Yeah, we're going to be here yeah. afterwards. So, so to, you get everything that you maybe have about it. So to answer the, que the first question about the, the, are you talking about the line that was kind of through this area here? Well, it wasn't on this map. It yeah. was on a map that's a little bit past this one. It looked like there were, like, oh, right there. Yeah, yeah. There. Okay. Yeah, and so, and I apologize, I should have brought that up. So the, the line that we that we show here is a line that was pulled from that, that FEMA floodplain map, because that's where they have identified slow paths. However, we know that normally there's not a clear, you know, there's not a channel here. This is three yards and backyard. Well, I'm confused. You're showing two branches there. Yeah. And on the left, that's so the a little bit tough to see. Right. Right. Yeah. So they kind of diverge here because the main channel flows and north and then it's there's you know along 145th um, then it, it's kind of channelized however when the water gets to a certain point it can't be contained within that channel and then it spills over and flows over the land and this is roughly the path that it follows and then eventually it all kind of meets back up mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like a diversion channel so during a flood event it don't you know there there kind of are two separate flow paths but if I go back to that FEMA map what you can see is that um, how they have it mapped is this, these hatched lines here. That's what I described as the floodway, and so that's where the majority of the flow is. And that's the real creek. Yes. Okay. But this area here is still floodplain, and so while you know some flow does flow through that way and it does eventually make its way back to the main creek, it's not the majority. The majority of the flow is going the other way. So thanks for bringing that up because it's not kind of a separate creek. It's just kind of a. It becomes a, a you know. A separate creek in a flood event, so. That's what we call the sandbar. Yes, <laughs> yes, so. Okay, we're good, so now we can. I don't need the one. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Cedric, did you want the light off? Oh, yes, please. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Cedric Robertson, and I work for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. I also brought my uh, uh, MWRD team with me. Uh, they can also be my bodyguards, so you guys need to, to watch out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my immediate supervisor, uh, Joe Kratzer, um, he's in charge of the Phase 2 program. His boss, John uh, Murray, and he's in charge of our stormwater management section. And we also have um, a member from the consultant team that got this job, um, Burns McDonald, Mr. Anthony Bryan. Okay, to go ahead and get started with this, uh, the project area is basically in the vicinity of 153rd Street and Laverne Avenue in Oak Forest to 146th Street and Pulaski and Midlothian. Uh, we told the consultant that our scope of work is to basically develop flood mitigation alternatives for the Natty Creek drainage uh, area. The current status of the project, they, they, are, they have modeled the existing watershed uh, and they are now evaluating alternatives to address the Natty Creek flooding and uh, developing conceptual costs. The one thing that I want to stress is that our goal is to implement the most effective and economical flood mitigation uh, project possible we have to make sure that the project is economically uh, feasible. Highlights today, uh, they, the consultant has reviewed the Little Calumet River detailed watershed plan and also um, to address, uh, ma'am, your question about the, uh, what did you call it, the concrete? Uh, <laughs> concrete <laughs> Creek. The Concrete Creek. Um, or Cement Creek, yeah, either. 
In running the model, uh, the consultant found that uh, in the vicinity of 149th Street, the current system provides a two-year storm event level of protection, which means that beyond a two-year storm, water comes out of the banks. Uh, the H and H model currently shows that the village installed the village installed bridges at Keeler, Carlaw, and Keystone lowered the 100-year water surface elevation by one foot. And um, the consultant is currently reviewing various alternatives to address overbank flooding, uh, which involves uh, detention, conveyance improvements, uh, potential property acquisition. And the one thing I also want to mention is that the priority is to maximize the amount of vacant land uh, in the project area. But before we review the conceptual alternatives, um, I would like to review the tributary area. In short, the tributary area downstream of the Oak Creek Detention Basin is much larger than the tributary area to the uh, is much larger to the tributary area downstream. Um, I'm sorry. The tributary area downstream of the Oak Creek Detention Basin is much larger than the tributary area to the Oak Creek Detention Basin itself. And there is much <laughs> more storm runoff being generated downstream or past the Oak Creek Detention Basin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you guys have any questions in regard to that? Where's Oak, the Oak Creek Detention Basin? Are you kidding? That's the big one. That's the big one. That's the big one. Oh, okay. That's the one in Oak Forest. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the big one. We're going to drown you. Okay. She's keeping us on our toes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, basically, this is the project area. Um, there's uh, the potential to install up to five detention areas along Natty Creek, three in Oak Forest, and two in Midlothian. The ponds will have an estimated storage capacity of 105 acre feet. Um, that translates to roughly 34.2 million gallons of water. There's also uh, the potential to upsize five restrictive culverts along Natty Creek, one at Oak Forest. Let's see if I can find it here. And four in Midlothian. This is the border and the rest of the um, culvert, culvert um, upsizing is in Midlothian. Cedric, do you have locations at this time? Yes. Uh, the one at Oak Forest, 151st Street between La Crosse Avenue and Cicero. Um, the four in Midlothian, 149th Street and Kilpatrick. Uh, Kenton, 147th and Colmar. And Kilbourne um, Avenue. We are also looking at increasing the concrete channel uh, cross section located at 149th Street between Kilpatrick and Knox. And lastly, the installation of a diversion conduit along 149th Street east to uh, Costner, north on Costner to 148th Street, east on 148th Street to Keeler Avenue to outfall further downstream of uh, Navy Creek. Did you just say you want to extend Cement Creek? Yeah. Yes. 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 Widen it. Can we clap now? <laughs> you won't need the, your bodyguards so far. The, the other thing I want to stress is that these are just conceptual ideas that they're yeah. reviewing. We want right to encourage now. that. <laughs> this is a rendering of what um, the detention pond areas could look like uh, basically, pocket parks, soccer fields, etc. It's possible to uh, make the detention ponds dual purpose. Also have uh, connecting bike slash walking trails. But once again, I have to stress, to reach this point of the project, we must make sure the project makes economical sense. After a project estimate is estimated, we will discuss cost sharing uh, with the village of Midlothian and the city of Oak Forest. The project must make sense uh, for all parties involved. Uh, how many people uh, 
do we have here in this project area at 143rd and Linda? 143rd and what? Linda. 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 Oh, that's the other. Okay. Well, you guys hit the jack jackpot. We're looking at two phase two projects in Midlothian, uh, but Berman Township submitted uh, this project um, on behalf of, of Midlothian. And the project is in the, uh, well, let me back up. The consultant working on this project is Infrastructure Engineering Incorporated. Uh, the uh, project area is in the vicinity of 143rd Street and Linder Avenue, which is the Calumet Sag Tributary C uh, channel. Uh, the scope of work given to the consultant was to address flooding and erosion along Trib C channel. And the conceptual alternatives that we are currently looking at um, are as follows, raising the effective roadways, 143rd Street and Linder Avenue intersections, um, increasing the size of Linder Avenue culvert and 143rd Street culvert. Um, we're also looking at conveyance improvements, which is basically reshaping the channel slash ditch. And uh, there is potential for storm storage at the northern end and the southern end of the channel. Um, they're currently performing, performing modeling of the existing watershed conditions and they're continuing um, to do ongoing evaluation of alternatives. This is our website. Um, at the end of the meeting, I also brought some of my business cards if you guys uh, want to take one with you. Um, at this website, you can uh, purchase rain barrels. Um, as well as report any blockages in Natty Creek that you are uh, aware of. Uh, before I open it up to uh, questions, I just basically <coughs> want to thank uh, the Village of Midlothian officials, as well as the Army Corps and CNT for allowing us to join in in your presentation. And now I want to open it up to you guys. But let me get my bodyguards to stand up just in case. <laughs> You would make a much better bodyguard than that. Lights, Cedric, what type of feedback are you are you looking for? You know, it's kind of confusing for us because we're interested in you know what some of your ideas were, but what type of Questions or feedback are you really looking for? Because you know we just want to know when. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow sounds great. Or how likely? Or you know what can we do to contribute? You know to making this more possible. Money. I mean we know well, what we want. You know we just don't know how to get there fast enough. Well, let me start off by saying that um, first and foremost our. Our goal is to try to solve the uh, flooding problem in your area. Uh, we will try to reach the 100-year storm um, level of protection, but if it's not economically feasible, then we'll work backwards from there and see what type of protection we can provide you in this area. But um, um, Because, with, Patrick, with, can I just sorry. say one yes. thing? Is our usual, before this last year, this last year, we had nine significant floods in 15 weeks. Previous to that, we had a, a long-standing normal. Our normal was a three-inch rain in 24 hours would produce what you've seen in our photos. So the 100-year rain and the 200 and the 500-year rain, that doesn't exist normal. here. That's our three-inch 24-hour rain. So you know, when, when I was looking at some of what you got up there, I'm thinking, how do we fit into that category? Because we don't compare to that category. Okay. Well, basically, we're looking at those conceptual ideas in order to uh, um, eliminate the flooding for all those different levels. When you were talking about the bridges? Yes. And what that made better? That didn't make anything better for us. And we are just four blocks from where that happened. You know, it didn't make anything better. The so we're just wanting to make sure that you know, whatever is going to be planned, that they understand that that didn't change a thing here. That changed the thing for the people on 145th Street that live along that creek, mm -hmm. but it didn't change anything that happens before it. Okay. Yeah. it. It changed eight blocks. 
And it didn't change one, one small detail, one block south of there is where I live. And that's where there's two and four feet of standing water after a three inch rain okay. in 24 hours. And I can attest to that. I live on Keeler Avenue, about four or five houses south of the creek. And prior to the bridge and culvert on Keeler Avenue being replaced, you know, the whole street would flood up to my driveway, and my whole yard would be involved. All of our yards were involved. They put in the new culvert, they dredged the creek, and it's been Bridges. wonderful ever since. Helen lives, you know, not that. She lives just on the other side of 147. Half a block, block away. Some of the, Half a block the away. neighbors here, and they're still getting deluged. So Nothing in your in your information, you said by putting in those culverts along that Bridges. east, or, well, it's culverts and yeah. bridges. Replacing those along that east-west, that last leg of the creek has helped us on our side of town, on the north side of 147, but it hasn't helped anybody on the south side. Well, that's why we're looking at the, uh, let me put it back up here, looking at having scattered detention ponds right. throughout the, uh, the length of uh, Natalie Creek. Okay. And that should be able to solve the problem, as well as the uh, divergent conduit. Um, I'm not positive, but I think the divergent conduit might be going through your, your oh, neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? What is that? A diversion. An underground yeah. pipe? Uh, underground pipe. Underground pipe? Like to, under to carry the water, yeah, to, yeah. to, to carry the water away. Okay. Okay. Cedric, what, I, what I'm hearing them saying is that we got to make sure that whatever uh, protection or whatever um, projects that you do, you look at the full range of frequencies, not just targeting the remote frequencies, the 100 year. Right. It's good to have a goal of 100 year level protection, but it sounds like the- We don't fit into that measurement. Well, it, it's not really fitting in. You're experiencing flooding at a much more frequent rate at the lower yeah. level. At much, lower level. Much, much, like half. Right. Half it's, what it's, you measure. Like and it's so when you're, when you're planning a project such as this, you know, we, we typically try to uh, address the, the maximum uh, damages, so like those extreme events. Um, but we, in this case, we need to make sure that there's, uh, that it's effective at these lower levels so that the inflow structures at those, at those reservoirs are taking flow at, at, at more of the lower, lower uh, frequencies, lower okay. events, not just holding that storage for the 100 year event and like that diversion channel, you know, making sure that it's, it's not just uh, being used at the 100 year event or the, or the very extreme event. So I think that's the feedback that, that, that you guys are get, given. If I, if I may, we are looking at all the, uh, all the different scenarios. I think the key to those, um, the new bridges that got put in and lowering the foot elevation 12 inches is that it didn't um, help you guys because the, the main source of the problem is upstream of that. That culvert at Kilpatrick is the one that Cedric mentioned had a two-year level of service, mm -hmm. and that's where the water gets backed up over tops and goes over land to everyone's mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. But the key is that now that those bridges are in, there's more um, ability to uh, help upstream because that, that flood level is lower 12 inches, and so we can kind of convey more of the water there, use some of the detention to help that location at Kilpatrick not over top of that two-year, at that five-year, 10-year, 25-year level of storm, which is what moves towards solving you guys' problem. And I think when we look at level of services, we're looking at all, we're, we're running the two-year storm, the five-year storm, the 10, 25, 50, 100, and seeing what affects different sizes of conveyance improvements, different amounts of detention improvements, um, what help it has in the community, and also cross-checking that with how much each of these improvements costs. And as we go through all these different scenarios, we come up with uh, cost-benefit analysis, and then we see what kind of improvement fits into every, you know, fits into everyone's um, you know, idea of what we need to do. So all that is getting looked at and getting analyzed. It might be helpful if I did my last PowerPoint, because that almost adds the final okay. dimension to things, and then we could ask more questions, because is okay. that OK? And then we could, we could discuss everything kind of in its entirety, because I'm talking more about distributed storage.
um, one of the questions that, one of the sort of things that we started to think about when we were looking, you, you see that you've kind of got it in my head, those <laughs> dots of where flooding is occurring and the extent to which they are so spread right across the village. And so if you, you know, invest in solutions in one area, you're still not investing in, in other areas. So, so one of the things we need to think about is how you, in a way, uh, distribute that storage right across the village as, as much as possible in a way that's economical. Um, and the way that you can do that economical, uh, economically is if you do it in a way that um, brings additional, that, that if you do it in a way that, that is multi-purpose. So if every time you dig up a street, you put storage in, and you do it in a way that's aesthetically beautiful, uh, you can then enhance the village. Um, or if every time you create a, a detention pond, you put a bike trail, then you can get money from DOT to help put in that bike trail that will add value to it. So it's, it's looking, at, looking at ways of storing water across the village that's, that serves multiple purposes, but also um, is, um, is financed through multiple uh, sources of money. And so in thinking about that, I started communicating a bit with Karen, and she was um, saying, well, you need to look at this plan, because it's come up in, in this plan, and, and there's another plan. And, and so we started to, to realize that there's a lot of plans already in the village that's talk, that are starting to talk about this distributed storage. Um, and we thought the best way to sort of think about it was to look at what people have actually recommended thus far. So I'm just going to flip through those plans. These are, these are ones from the village. So I'll just say, here's some slides of distributed storage. If every time you dig up a road, you put some kind of storage, so those plants are just means of storing water. Here's a car park with permeable paving, so the water goes, literally goes straight through the paving. It doesn't, the paving doesn't act as a channel in this case. And then those green areas, are, oh, again, they, the water is diverted into them. They're, they're, they're called swales. Um, oh, here's an example of a street. You know, many of you live on streets like this. Here's a, here's a means of storing water. So it's not, it's not perfect for the water where you're, you know, you're several foot deep. But it is way, a good way of getting a lot of, a lot of storage right across the village. A lot of you just, you know, you're all contributing to each other's water. And if you could just kind of hold it where it is, you're, it's not going to get channeled. Oh, oh, here's a town centre that has a mixture of permeable paving and, um, and bioswales that store water. And it's also part of a village enhancement plan. So it's, you know, they, they've upgraded the streets and it's, it's going to be adding value to the area. Or here's, you know, here's you can, you can buy out a vacant property and make that a, a wet pond, which adds to the beauty of the area. And so the, the benefits are that it brings economic, community, and environmental benefits, which enhance property values. You can use multiple funding sources, for example, transport dollars, or I was just hearing that IDNR has money for parks, you can have pocket parks that have uh, that act as storage during heavy rains. You have, you have these multiple purposes. It can be fairly quick to install, and it spreads the risks and the benefits across the village. <clears throat> so we looked at the various plans. The village, uh, 2005, the village uh, centre enhancement plan, and it was to create a central place uh, for the, for the Midlothian community. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these, but it was it was tr trying to you know bring money and investment into the community by improving the quality of life in that community. Um, that was back in 2005, and interestingly, um, they said that the most sustainable approach to development is to keep all development out of the floodway, which is marked on the map. Um, but they did still recommend uh, development in, in the floodplains, uh, but they said to do so in a way um, that would reduce long-term flooding. In that plan, they did develop, you can see in the blue areas, um, some areas for potential storage. I'm going through these quite quickly. It's really just to show you. So those are the blue areas for the storage. So that, those are areas that have already been identified in village plans where there could be some capacity for stormwater storage. 
Um, there was, in 2011, there was an active transportation plan done, um, and that included recommendations for, I think it was a, 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 either a cycle path or a walkway along Natalie Creek. Um, and there were, oh yes, uh, Natalie Creek walk trail to be improved and extended and a bike loop around the village, connecting the village green parks and residential streets. Um, in 2013, uh, there was a Midlothian Creek Green Infrastructure Plan, and that ha identified a whole of those areas A, B, and C, are uh, uh, areas where, where it was suggested that there was a lot of this green infrastructure put in place. 2014, um, uh, there was a village centre plan done that was done by UAC. Um, Kelsey is here, <coughs> she was involved in that. Um, and they recommended actually shifting the town centre away from its existing area because that is in a floodplain. Um, so due to the existence of a 500 and, uh, 100 year floodplain which covers a significant portion of this property, rendering it legally and logistically undevelopable, this land is inappropriate for new development. So it was suggested that the village centre moved away. This new core development project will help provide an anchor tenant in the village centre to help spur new retail development while also focusing development outside of areas impacted by the area's flooding issues. So this is a, a screen of some of the um, development that was recommended. So they recommended um, a visually establish the village centre as a space of activity, um, install gateway features, <coughs> establish a civic presence in the village centre, establish a park, and enhance green space. And a lot of this is just significant because one of the things that you were telling us was this sense of of a disorder and um, visual, you know, chaos. And so there's ways that you could start to, to manage stormwater and build uh, visual enhancement. Um, so they recommended utilizing green infrastructure, stormwater best management practices, and the kind of things I was just showing you, um, to, uh, to put them within parks and parking lots, to, um, to, on 147 to make that a complete street. So a complete street is a street that serves multiple purposes. So it would include stormwater, you could keep the stormwater in the area, but also just better cycle, cycle and walkways and um, upgraded retail areas. Increase of parkway space. So we looked at those various plans. Um, in addition, there was work done uh, for the RTA. Karen knows much better about this than, than I do. Um, there's an Illinois Green Infrastructure Grant project going on right now. Um, there are various redevelopment sites already identified, um, which could act as, so development sites could always act as, as ways of also storing water and, and um, little developers as well. So if you map all of these together, um, you could show, this map is just to show that, that there are lots of ideas for things that can, can be done in the area already. Someone's, people have done a lot of thinking about this that would include enhancements for the village um, as well as helping you manage your stormwater. And it's, and, it's, and it's a good way of kind of thinking of how MWRD's work might map onto that and create a, a bigger, bigger sense of a, a plan for the whole community, one that not only stops your flooding right, as much as possible across the village, but actually makes it a, a more beautiful <coughs> village. That's the end. Okay. as to why the recommendation is to shift the location of the town center because the town center area even though it's located in a floodplain doesn't flood 
So I thought that was going to be part of the discussion to get it out of the floodplain so that we could develop it. That, that is the village's goal. We have been seeking grant money so we can get a job. Eric, is it a Loma, Lomar? Yes, Loma. Lomar. Lomar. Lomar, yeah. Um, so that, because we know the downtown doesn't flood. So if it doesn't flood, how did it end up in the floodplain? You have to ask. FEMA, right? I think, I think when we actually mapped on some of the the um, where people are flooding, there were quite a few actually in the town centre. So it's just to confuse things. Right. <laughs> oh, but 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 the, the the recommendation from the UIC students was move your town centre east of the tracks because it's not in the floodplain and that's easier to develop because when you're in the floodplain you've got a ton of restrictions for so the east, development. So east of the tracks does not flood no, only not less floodplain. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, and then my now, question. The recent mapping that ended in Actually there was a map. Uh, uh, your, your recent mapping showed that it did not kind of match with the residents are saying that it doesn't actually flood that area. It pretty much stays in its banks. That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And because I'm, I'm thinking like the town center is where you're going to develop just, you know, within a block or a half a block on either side of 147th Street, you know, going east and west up and down the road. And as far as I know, a half a block either side of 147th, both sides of 147th does not flood. But I'm not talking so about the Pulaski. If it's in the floodplain, you have to go through the uh, requirement of building in a floodplain, even if it doesn't flood. Right? Okay. Yeah. And that's, that, that's the, the next problem. thing is, like somebody said, the Lomar is to go mm -hmm. through a whole process so, to prove to FEMA that this is the elevations yeah. that are actually higher and it needs to, need to actually be remapped to okay. get out of the floodplain. Okay, so does the flood plain and immediately on the east side of the tracks or is it like a block or two further east? Aaron's got a man. <laughs> <laughs> right here. It was the map that I had before. It's not on here. The, the, I can hold the FEMA map if that's what you're... And just, <laughs> so that's where we did get examples of... Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this is that, that map. That this is the FEMA map. Right, right. So that's all the areas that are shaded in blue are where the development requirements would be in place. And then the diagonal line is the train, train tracks, right? right. 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 Yeah, so, that's a train. Right, right. so, 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 do, so right at those train tracks going east, east that's east. where the flood plane ends. Correct. Okay. Well, then why am I the number one? The trains are elevated, so the elevation. How often are these? What? Okay. Yeah. I live by Bremen High School. We have yeah. a high flood all the time. I flood when it. Oh, that's by Jolly Homes. That's a whole separate issue. Yeah, I think afterwards, if you look at the mirror on the wall here, they just don't you Ma'am, if you want to look at this map in a few minutes and we try to identify everybody, we did a non foot survey and I couldn't get to everybody's front door, but we tried to gather as much as we could. And like they said, they've marked off what they've identified, but they want everybody to make sure your problem is on that map before you leave okay. today. Okay. Hey, Aaron. Aaron, can you go to your first map that you had? Um, with the little drawings on there. Yeah, yeah, this is the same, roughly the same as yeah. what's up here. See all the yellow in the right lower corner? That's all the Jolly <coughs> Homes area. Yep, the yellow spot. That's your house. house. Okay. Who's got the pointer? Yeah, this <coughs> Which one is the one right here? Yeah. That's 151st Street. Yep. That little spot oh, going up here. is Bridgeway. Mm -hmm. That takes yeah. it the most. And, and, and it's a joke. Yeah. 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 Watch your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this is 151st right here. This is Ridgeway. We all know that this whole, all this water comes out and it goes out to this channel right here. This is a, this is the crosswalk through Jolly Homes. And I believe this may be Hamlin or Lawndale. This is another area that holds water. These are just the low points. They, this water can't get in until this channel goes down. And the main problem we have is the intersection of Ridgeway right here is the same grade is this ditch right here. So that's a whole separate issue than all these creeks. This is all going out to the Calumet. Union Ditch. Union Ditch. So we gotta find some way to get a better outflow here, whether it be a lift station in the future, you know, send it this way and out that way, but those are different issues than the creek. So it's not being addressed currently. 
What's that? Will it will it be addressed? We're trying to find we're trying to find funding to get into some different programs. Right now, they're just doing the phase two program, and that's addressing Natalie Creek. And but Joe, weren't they doing a study? I thought you guys were doing a study. MWRD was starting to do some kind of a study over there. Not that I know. We're Hydrologic or hydraulic or what are your words? Yes, they were. Yeah. Yeah. In right. that area. Okay. This is this is before yeah, I. So that's the little Cal watershed, so it's probably. Mm -hmm. Jerry, can you explain it? What we knew? What we knew was that there was a study going on in two sections, Natalie Creek and Valley Homes. Um, February and March was my understanding that... Uh, there was a letter that came, Jerry. Yes. And it was from you guys. From MWRD. <laughs> <laughs> We're not currently doing any study, per, you know, present time study on Academy Union of the Dish. You know, we did cover that in our detailed watershed plan, which was completed a couple years ago. So I'm going to look up the form and I'm going to send it to you tomorrow. And then we can maybe clarify that question because we did get a letter from MWRD and it. It did say you were doing something over there in the Jolly Homes area. It was a study oh. of some sort. You know, I think we did do some uh, debris removal. No, that wasn't it. It was like in January. Studying the crown. Uh, you know what? I can go through that, I guess. Because it Great. stated that um, it would be out in February and March. And everybody that lived over there got all excited, so we want to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of debris removal, on December 19th, Metro was at um, Midlothian Creek at 147th Street, and they were on the south side of the creek, and they had big, whatever the machine is, and they were digging out branches and debris and all kinds of stuff and filled up like two dumpsters on their flatbed, and at 1.30 they left, but they said they would be back. So. I'm assuming that the spring, I'm hoping the spring they will be back. So, Joe, I hope you can follow up with that. Well, most of it they dumped in the creek. I don't know if you saw that. They what? Most, all, what? most of it they dumped in the creek and ended up behind Firehouse Hot Dog. You should have seen the <laughs> No, no, no. They were, on, on December 19th, they were behind Firehouse Hot Dogs cleaning well, the stuff is back, out. this is back about the same time. Like whatever it fit in the dumpsters went in the creek, the Lothian Creek. Okay, well, they're and supposed to be piled up, up all the way up to the height of the bridge there by the tracks. And right. And Firehouse Hot Dog. So I had to call Metra and fight with them. They finally came out and got a crane and pulled it all out of there. Well, that, that's what saw. they were doing on December 19th. That's what I saw. Them so you say there's some branches somewhere else? No, no. They were there and they were pulling branches yeah, out, but they didn't get all the branches. Well, they were trimming all the brush along the banks of the creek. So they need to come and, and, they need to come and finish cleaning it out. So my question is, we have a similar issue along Natalie Creek. Every time there's a storm, Natalie, certain portions of Natalie Creek get filled with old branches and debris that have blown in because of well, a storm. Because all along Natalie Creek, there are, there are sections of Natalie Creek that are overgrown with brush and trees. So my question is, while we're waiting for all the various agencies to finish the planning and the, the developing, and then finally the construction of whatever is going to be done, can the agencies get together and come out and clean up along the Italy Creek? Well, cut down branches, clean things out, dredge it out. See, that's what Cedric said earlier, is we can call to report things. And actually, you guys have been out in areas, like in Jamie's area. They have come out, but mm -hmm. we have to be able to go to the website and actually report those things so they can okay. come out and discover. So you, can, you can report them to me. That's yeah, can we just honor. call you? Cause yes, I... and I prefer that because we'll go out and do what we can before we call them. But they're great. You know, okay, but I've never done things. the email that I have been wanting to send you. And just trying to bring to your attention and wanted your thoughts really quick. Um, I've been talking with some people about actually just manually, yes, cleaning out certain portions of the creek. If we were to ask for like pickup points, I would like to think that as long as we give you notice, <laughs> you'd be able to get them away from the side, sure. which is an issue that sure. tends to, yes, the next storm well, they, tumble. And their small streams uh, crew has a lot of great equipment that will help. 
we work with them. We'll haul the stuff away. They'll come. Oh, yeah. So if there's any kind of big problems, which they've been out probably, I've only been doing this job a year, they've been out at least eight, ten times. Mm -hmm. they've, okay. been they've taken whole trees down. Okay, but I can walk right over here. <laughs> and then just, you know. What I'm saying is if you call me, let me know, email All me. Right. I'll take a look at it. It's something we can handle on our own without bothering them. They have a lot of okay. things to take care of, but a small amount of people and equipment to do it. Well, then we're so. hoping to do that at some point. Sure. Manually so, do some cleaning. Didn't they say that they don't want residents in there cleaning out the creek because it's an insurance issue? There insurance. is an insurance issue already on the plate in the sense that people are hashing in on insurance policies for losses due to flooding that Branch has cleaned out that if we're willing to do it. Well, no. she, the, she could get I, a I think there's somebody here from IDNR, right? Yeah, there is. Well, we did it. Nope. Where is she? Well, and then just take this. I have a really told us not to do it. Sort of a generalized question. So, uh, when Erin put the property map up and showed development since the 70s, the golf course was there, and we, we noted very much that the golf course is a major contributing part to what ends up dumping a lot of water into Natalie Creek at the head of it. Um, and that property has been owned by the Forest Preserve. Unlike other areas where there's new residential development, it now has to meet those codes. Since the Forest Preserve has owned their property, do they, excuse me, do they have to um, follow, the same. follow the same set of codes in terms of making upgrades to their property? They haven't changed it, it's still in theirs, but yet they make all these new engineering plans to raise the height of the golf courses, re-engineer it so it's not flooding, and yet dump more water rather than holding it on their property. So can you, anyone address how that affects the forest preserve since that is a major contributing part of why we flood here? Mm -hmm. Doesn't the ordinance have criteria? Like if you're disturbing so many acres or you have to do it. Right, it doesn't the, matter. The forest you preserve, it or, yeah, the forest preserve district like any other Entity is uh, required to follow the watershed management ordinance. Okay. So they come in for permits from time to time. So, so if they're filling, you know, in a floodplain, you're disturbing uh, more than 5,000 square feet, they, they should be coming for a permit. But what if they don't? What if there's so, a barrier? So well, so they they do do remember, if they don't, count. they don't, and they're doing a construction project, and someone calls us, and we go out there and see that they're doing something, then we would. Take action from there. So over the summer when all the agencies were here and the, the Cook County Forest Preserve was here, we had talked about it and it was um, Mrs. Slattery, I believe her name was, yep. uh, said, you know, we were unaware. So has anything come of their awareness to, you know, looking at something? Um, you know, I, I noticed in the fall that they had dug up a bunch of sections around the trail. I saw the blue MWRD paint out there, spray painted and arrows and your acronym for your name. But I really couldn't get to the bottom of what was occurring there. I kind of was excited thinking maybe they were doing something after the meeting when we discussed it. But it is true. I, I had been out there many, many times over the years, almost daily. And when there is low spots or flooding spots, they just raise it. They open up and so and everything gets raised and there and also I did email various people at the, the agencies here and and a few more um, our concern has been largely on the what we perceive as a very underused Oak Creek Plaza detention reservoir and there is new construction just 100 feet in front of it now going south and our concern was how is that actually being managed I understand you have a new watershed management ordinance but we're looking at a problem that is such a problem area as it is that we can barely comprehend pouring more cement in the ground so when we talked about it last night here I think your answer was something to the effect of it's just being redeveloped there was there hasn't been anything in there in years it's been the oak fest for years it's been a gravel or an empty parking lot for longer than I can remember so they have built the dialysis center. There's a big hole in the ground, piles of gravel, and two signs for sale or for lease on property. It's literally four areas. So that is already watershed on the other side of the Oak Creek Plaza hole. How can we get an answer from somebody as to how that's going to affect 
not only your plans as you're planning that now, but how is it going to affect us otherwise? So, so development in itself is a good thing. You know, if it's done, you could do it in a way that that holds a lot of stormwater, holds more than the than the development mm -hmm. itself is generating, and that's I guess that's why I was sort of trying to map all of this stuff into a plan so that you're, you're using this development to the benefit of, of flood management. So who are we communicating yeah. that with and is it factoring into your design? You well, know, if, I, if I could yeah. for, for a second here, we're, we're talking about a lot of different things that are going to be put in here right now. And the first thing uh, with the Forest Preserve District, uh, they were doing some project, I'm not aware of what it was. If it was some sort of maintenance project where mm -hmm. you were redoing uh, bike paths or something like that. Because they flood. If they were redoing bike paths and putting them at the same grade, it wouldn't trigger the need for watershed management permit. Just like if a street